interaction with the master which might have been his experience had he been willing to do at this time the very thing which Jesus asked, and which, several years subsequently, he actually did. Riches have nothing directly to do with entrance into the kingdom of heaven, but the love of wealth does. The spiritual loyalties of the kingdom are incompatible with servility to materialistic mammon. Man may not share his supreme loyalty to a spiritual ideal with a material devotion. Jesus never taught that it was wrong to have wealth. He required only the twelve and the seventy to dedicate all of their worldly possessions to the common cause. Even then he provided for the profitable liquidation of their property, as in the case of the Apostle Matthew. Jesus many times advised his well-to-do disciples as he taught the rich man of Rome. The master regarded the wise investment of excess earnings as a legitimate form of insurance against future and unavoidable adversity. When the apostolic treasury was overflowing, Judas put funds on deposit to be used subsequently when they might suffer greatly from a diminution of income. This Judas did after consultation with Andrew. Jesus never personally had anything to do with the apostolic finances except in the disbursement of alms. But there was one economic abuse which he many times condemned, and that was the unfair exploitation of the weak, unlearned, and less fortunate of men by their strong, keen, and more intelligent fellows. Jesus declared that such inhuman treatment of men, women, and children was incompatible with the ideals of the brotherhood of the kingdom of heaven. 3. The Discussion About Wealth By the time Jesus had finished talking with Matadormus, Peter and a number of the apostles had gathered about him, and, as the rich young man was departing, Jesus turned around to face the apostles and said, You see how difficult it is for those who have riches to enter fully into the kingdom of God. Spiritual worship cannot be shared with material devotions. No man can serve two masters. You have a saying that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the heathen to inherit eternal life. And I declare that it is as easy for this camel to go through the needle's eye as for these self-satisfied rich ones to enter the kingdom of heaven. When Peter and the apostles heard these words, they were astonished exceedingly, so much so that Peter said, Who then, Lord, can be saved? Shall all who have riches be kept out of the kingdom? And Jesus replied, no, Peter, but all who put their trust in riches shall hardly enter into the spiritual life that leads to eternal progress. But even then, much which is impossible to man is not beyond the reach of the Father in heaven. Rather should we recognize that with God all things are possible. As they went off by themselves, Jesus was grieved that Matadormus did not remain with them, for he greatly loved him. And when they had walked down by the lake, they sat there beside the water. And Peter, speaking for the twelve, who were all present by this time, said, We are troubled by your words to the rich young man. Shall we require those who would follow you to give up all their worldly goods? And Jesus said, No, Peter, only those who would become apostles, and who desire to live with me as you do, and as one family. But the Father requires that the affections of his children be pure and undivided. Whatever thing or person comes between you and the love of the truths of the kingdom must be surrendered. If one's wealth does not invade the precincts of the soul, it is of no consequence in the spiritual life of those who would enter the kingdom. And then said Peter, But Master, we have left everything to follow you. What then shall we have? And Jesus spoke to all of the twelve, Verily, verily, I say to you, there is no man who has left wealth, home, wife, brethren, parents, or children, for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, who shall not receive manifold more in this world, perhaps with some persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. But many who are first shall be last, while the last shall often be first. The Father deals with his creatures in accordance with their needs, and in obedience to his just laws of merciful and loving consideration for the welfare of a universe. The kingdom of heaven is like a householder, who was a large employer of men, and who went out early in the morning to hire laborers to work in his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers to pay them a denarius a day, he sent them into the vineyard. Then he went out about nine o'clock, and seeing others standing in the marketplace idle, he said to them, Go you also to work in my vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will pay you. And they went at once to work. 
Again he went out about twelve, and about three, and did likewise. And going into the marketplace about five in the afternoon, he found still others standing idle, and he inquired of them, Why do you stand here idle all the day? And the men answered, Because nobody has hired us. Then said the householder, Go you also to work in my vineyard, and whatever is right I will pay you. When evening came, this owner of the vineyard said to his steward, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last hired and ending with the first. When those who were hired about five o'clock came, they received a denarius each, and so it was with each of the other laborers. When the men who were hired at the beginning of the day saw how the later comers were paid, they expected to receive more than the amount agreed upon. But, like the others, every man received only a denarius. And when each had received his pay, they complained to the householder, saying, These men who were hired last worked only one hour, and yet you have paid them the same as us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching sun. Then answered the householder, My friends, I do you no wrong. Did not each of you agree to work for a denarius a day? Take now that which is yours, and go your way, for it is my desire to give to those who came last as much as I have given to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Or do you begrudge my generosity, because I desire to be good and to show mercy? 4. Farewell to the Seventy it was a stirring time about the Magadan camp the day the Seventy went forth on their first mission. Early that morning, in his last talk with the Seventy, Jesus placed emphasis on the following. 1. The gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed to all the world, to Gentile as well as to Jew. 2. While ministering to the sick, refrain from teaching the expectation of miracles. 3. Proclaim a spiritual brotherhood of the sons of God, not an outward kingdom of worldly power and material glory. 4. Avoid loss of time through overmuch social visiting and other trivialities which might detract from wholehearted devotion to preaching the gospel. 5. If the first house to be selected for a headquarters proves to be a worthy home, abide there throughout the sojourn in that city. 6. Make clear to all faithful believers that the time for an open break with the religious leaders of the Jews at Jerusalem has now come. 7. Teach that man's whole duty is summed up in this one commandment, Love the Lord your God with all your mind and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. This they were to teach as man's whole duty, in place of the 613 rules of living expounded by the Pharisees. When Jesus had talked thus to the seventy in the presence of all the apostles and disciples, Simon Peter took them off by themselves and preached to them their ordination sermon, which was an elaboration of the Master's charge given at the time he laid hands upon them and set them apart as messengers of the kingdom. Peter exhorted the seventy to cherish in their experience the following virtues. 1. Consecrated Devotion To pray always for more laborers to be sent forth into the gospel harvest. He explained that, when one so prays, he will the more likely say, Here am I, send me. He admonished them to neglect not their daily worship. 2. True Courage He warned them that they would encounter hostility and be certain to meet with persecution. Peter told them their mission was no undertaking for cowards, and advised those who were afraid to step out before they started, but none withdrew. 3. Faith and Trust they must go forth on this short mission wholly unprovided for. They must trust the Father for food and shelter and all other things needful. 4. Zeal and Initiative They must be possessed with zeal and intelligent enthusiasm. They must attend strictly to their master's business. Oriental salutation was a lengthy and elaborate ceremony. Therefore had they been instructed to salute no man by the way which was a common method of exhorting one to go about his business without the waste of time. It had nothing to do with the matter of friendly greeting. 5. Kindness and Courtesy The Master had instructed them to avoid all unnecessary waste of time in social ceremonies, but he enjoined courtesy toward all with whom they should come in contact. They were to show every kindness to those who might entertain them in their homes. They were strictly warned against leaving a modest home to be entertained in a more comfortable or influential one. 6. 
ministry to the sick. The seventy were charged by Peter to search out the sick in mind and body and to do everything in their power to bring about the alleviation or cure of their maladies. And when they had been thus charged and instructed, they started out two and two on their mission in Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. Although the Jews had a peculiar regard